it's pretty hard to follow those two because, um, and it's going to, I think it'll be like that all day. Every time somebody gets up to speak, they will be overwhelmed by what they've just heard. Um, just a point of correction, Alistair Warden was never the chairman of the Fame Toxicity Committee, I was. <laughs> because when they first met, about 25 of them, I was sent by Mrs. Hegarty to keep an eye on them, and I, I was the only one there who could, who could not claim to be a toxicologist. So they said, you'd better be chairman then, which, which happened. Um, Alistair Warden was a wonderful character. He was one of the great masters of the expense account. He used to charge us about 50 pounds a week for the use of his library at, at home. And it got to the point where I had to take him aside one day and, and said, uh, and I had to say, I'm sorry, but Frame can no longer afford to pay your expenses, and I will take over the things for which you charge us, and that, that's exactly what happened. Um, I actually want to talk about Bill Russell mainly today, and what I really want to say is, while appreciating all the fantastic things that have happened over the last 60 years, I think we are failing to benefit from what he tried to tell us because so few of us have actually ever read or thought about what he's tra um, trying to say in the book. The three hours is really not the most important part of the book at all. There are other major messages which we ought to, ought to look into. Um, so I'm really interested in the historical aspect. I'm delighted to work with John. Um, and the way we work together is, is in complete contrast to the way that Russell worked with Birch. I totally believe that Rex Birch had nothing whatsoever to do with the writing of the book. He didn't know what was in it. He didn't ever see a draft of it. And if he had, it would have to have been a different book because no co-author could ever have allowed the, the main author to, to get away with what Bill Russell did. So in the article we just submitted, every word is a word that we have agreed. And often we've agreed to change a word to have one which is slightly different from, from the one the person who first wrote it would like to have used. So I really want to quickly go through some aspects of, of the book and so on. And then I want to come up to think about how we should really appreciate in the future what he was trying to say. And I think we will move forward more satisfactorily if we do. I wouldn't claim to match up in any way to Russell's intellectual capacity, but we did do the same zoology course. The whole course was based on how different kinds of animals adapted to their environments. It would never, ever in one millionth of a millisecond ever have a, occurred to us to use one animal to try to think about what happened in another one. The whole point of our course was to look, and to look at them as being different and to understand thereby the, the kind of basic things which were required in any system. So um, um, the other thing, and we were also trained in problem solving. There was one problem I remember, I was just um, sitting there. In finals we had to dissect a snake and draw a diagram of its blood system. How on earth do you draw a diagram of a snake? There are, there, are, there are two ways. You can either have it curling around the page like that, or you can do a long piece and then say, continued on next page, <laughs> which, is, which, which, is, which is what I did. And the, the, the whole secret of the blood system in the snake is the heart. It's also our secret too. The human brain could never have developed if we hadn't had a four-chambered heart because the brain would never have got the blood supply in the way that it does, because in the other animals, lower animals, the blood tends to be much more mixed up. That is not the subject of today, so we must, we must move on. Um, um, this is the famous picture of Russell and Birch taken in Sheringham. This was the first time they'd met since 1959. This was, no, sorry, not the first time. They, they met when Marty um, got them together in 1991. It was the first meeting they'd been to together, probably ever. So I'm, I'm not sure that Rex was ever at, 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 at a scientific meeting with Russell. I don't think he went to U4 meetings, for example. Um, 
And what they gave us was a wonderful discussion on humanity and inhumanity, and of course the three R's. But the three R's aren't, aren't, aren't principles, they are guidance on, on how to think. And what they really wanted us to do was to think about what we were doing. Um, in the book they say, we hope the book may stimulate experimentalists to devote special attention to the subject and many others to work in full awareness of its existing possibilities. Well, if you put that into modern English, what they really want us to do is to think what we're doing and why and, and how to do it. Um, I've just I've submitted this paper with John. We've found some fascinating um, documents in, in the archive, but we've only begun to look at a few hundred of tens of thousands. Um, many of the people are he here have their own files in the archives. Every letter Andrew Rowan or Anna Goldberg or me or Bert Van Zutphen ever sent to Bill Russell, our letter is there plus his reply. And it's really quite fascinating. What fascinated me was he made us all feel unique and special and we never realized he was talking to other people in the way he was talking to us. It was, it was quite, quite wonderful to see. Um, Andrew has, perhaps along with my wife, been one of the two or three people who've had a profound influence on my life. It was Andrew who, who persuaded Mrs. Hegarty, I, I really wasn't so bad after all. At this conference, I'd said, what you can do with cell cultures is limited. And if, if you don't understand those, those limitations, then you shouldn't use them. Um, she believed everything was possible, and she hated me for that. Andrew persuaded her that nevertheless, maybe there was something in, in me after all. And of course, my whole life after that changed totally. At that meeting, which I was the, um, the penultimate speaker before tea, and the chairman said to me, the next speaker has, be, has been delayed and, and hasn't arrived. We can't move the, the tea interval, so could you speak for twice as long as in the program? <laughs> well, um, how many um, speakers at a conference have ever had the chairman say to them, will you take twice as long as allowed in the program? <laughs> that's, that's what happened. And I th maybe that helped Mrs. Hegarty be impressed. I, I don't know. Um, um, like others, I went to see Rex Birch at Sheringham, which is really near to where I was brought up and live. And we had this workshop there. Alan and I organized it together because Rex was too ill to travel. He had an awful form of skin cancer. He didn't have very long to live, about another six or nine months. And so we got people to come to him because we knew he couldn't come to us. And having in the middle there, Rex and Claire and Bill together was fantastic. I've been thinking about this. I don't think they made any contribution to the scientific discussion in the meeting. They spent most of their time in their own smoking because one of the first things I, I had to do as the organizer was to tell them at the first coffee break that smoking could not be allowed because they'd, they'd been chain, um, chain smoking through the whole, whole session. Um, but it was a wonderful to see them together and we produced um, a report for, uh, of the workshop, which really deserves to, to be revisited, because I think many of the things that have happened are discussed there and, and are foreseen. Um, all kinds of marvelous things have happened. Um, I mentioned the other day the, the Baltimore World Congress, which was a stroke of genius by Alan in, in, in organizing it. It was the first time many of us met Bill Russell, which was fantastic, and lots of things followed. Uh, in the third congress in, in Bologna, we had the Declaration of, of Bologna, which is about the three hours, and Bill Russell's signature is at the top of the middle column there. I think Julia's on there, Alan's on there, I'm on there, and there were other pages with, with another 800 signatures on them. That has just gone to the archive, and I, I hope they're going to put the original in a big frame on the wall, so that anybody who goes into the... Um, department will always see it. That, 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 that would be nice. Um, now, um, 
just some things about Bill Russell. He was, he was fantastic. By the way, I don't think he knew anything about experimental technique, not in the sense of, of practical techniques. He was really a philosopher. So if you look at the book, it's really written by a, a philosopher who's thinking about things, not by somebody who's talking about the reality. And when he does, it gets very un, un, uncomfortable reading. I could, I could never, I've probably read it a hundred times, the, the chapter on, on reduction. I still can't understand it now. It, it's unbelievable. Um, his enthusiasm was amazing. Even when he was trying to get a job and people were turning him down, he could somehow use their refusal as a means of sending back a glowing tribute to them for their kindness and generosity in considering him and then turning him down. Um, but he, 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 I, I've never seen him, in all the things we've, we've read so far, I've never seen a negative word about any other person. He would discuss ideas, but there's never anything said about somebody in a really negative way. Um, he was a polymath. He, he worked on all kinds of things. He could have been a leader in at least 20 different areas. And he chose, because of, of circumstances, which we are trying to understand, he chose not to be a, continue, a leader in this field. And when Marty discovered him, we discovered him, which is a good way of putting it. Um, after that, he kind of reveled in the new fame, which he richly deserved. But I don't, and I've edited, by the way, he always allowed me to edit, edit what he wrote, which was pretty unique. But I don't think he, he, he ever really came up with another original idea. And he rejoiced, he truly rejoiced in a marvelous way at what we were all doing. He loved us because we were respecting him and building on the, on, on the ideas he'd laid down. He was content to support us. He didn't want himself to get anything more out of it. I, I, I think that's fantastic. Um, the writing of the principles, how it was produced is a fascinating story which we are looking into. It's an appalling book to read. Um, it desperately needed editing. It could have been half the length, but every time I look at, I say it's a bit like the Bible, it's a bit naughty to say that, I suppose. <laughs> every time I look at it, I see something new that I hadn't seen before. And I, I think to myself, I've read this chapter 30 times. Why have I never really appreciate, appreciated that point? So it, it is a fantastic book, and I think one of the problems, and I think it is a problem, is that so few of the people who purport to be supporters of the Three R's concept have ever read the book. So I'm, I'm really rather disappointed that the euphoria which I think we felt at the end of the 90s when we had had three marvelous congresses and we left Bologna feeling the world was going to change and we would be leading it, it didn't actually happen. And I think that's very disappointing. Part, partly we didn't realize how strong would, would, would be the, the, wrist, the, um, uh, the resistance by those who wanted to continue um, using animals. And there's a danger that much of what we have tried to do is being ignored because there are circumstances where, where we don't have the power to see that it, 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 is, it is considered. I don't think people really understand what, what replacement means. This is something we need to think about very seriously. And, but we ought to be able to say with complete conviction that alternatives are really badly needed, especially as it happens by the pharmaceutical industry and especially in relation to some of the major human diseases we've got to deal with, such as dementia of various kinds. Um, if we look at drugs, for example, where, where, where is the evidence that preclinical testing of drugs in animals gives us safe, effective medicines? Where is it? I, I can't find it. And the answer is that there isn't enough of it because less than 10% of the, 
of new drugs survive the phase one, two, and three clinical trials. Um, th th this means a huge waste of resources, a huge unnecessary use of animals, and huge disappointment for patients who aren't getting the drugs that they badly need. And why do the regulators con continue to say, we like to see a dog study, when somebody can go along to them and, sh and, and provide scientific arguments for not doing a dog study in that particular case? This is really, really quite shocking. Now, the reason we should focus on drugs in terms of toxicology is because we have human data. For most other things, pesticides, cosmetics, all kinds of things, we just have animal data to think about or other, hopefully, more and more alternatives data. But in the case of drugs, we have the human data as well. Um, here's just the... This is produced by and for the industry. Um, only 9.6% of nearly 10,000 drugs from 7,500 development programs in more than 1,000 companies were actually able to progress from phase one through clinical trials to be acceptable to the FDA. That was 2000, up to 2015. But the FDA in 2004 had said the level was about 8% and something had to be done about it. So in the time between 2004 and 2015, almost no progress was actually made. Um, I did some work with, with anti-vivisectionists, which is very good scientists which is actually being ignored by the industry, the agencies, and almost everybody. We had data on 3,000 drugs, not collected and classified us, um, by us, but given to us to use. And we found that there is no evidence from the animal studies that could in any way um, help you decide whether something would or would not be acceptably um, toxic in, in humans. And we also found that no one animal type can tell you anything about other animal types. Even rat studies can't tell you what would happen in mice. So why on earth should we believe that they would actually work in us? I, I, I just don't understand it. Um, we need to have a true revolution then in the next decade. And this means we need, I think we need to look back at the principle. There are all kinds of things in the principles. One of them is models. You can't model something unless you know enough about what you're modeling and about the model you're using. If you wanted to um, make a model of a Boeing 747, you could have all the measurements of all the parts. And you, would, you could make sure that what you did matched at every stage in your small-scale model would be a genuine <laughs> replica, a model of what you were doing. Um, we, we don't have that information. It's a bit like um, looking in one black box to see what's in another one. And as somebody who does jigsaws all the time, my study is full of them because I, um, I only do them once and have them framed. It's like trying to do a jigsaw when you haven't got a picture on the, on the box to tell you what you're trying to do. And you, you've got the pieces. You don't know if you've got the right number or even if the pieces you've got are from the puzzle you're trying to do. So really we have a lot of confusion and we're trying to find our way through. Well, I, I think alternative methods and the better use of information, all kinds of things could be done to help us progress more, more, more satisfactorily than, um, than we are. Um, We've, we've, we've made some big mistakes. One particular one is using animal data as a means of validating non-animal tests, which is crazy. If we can show that the animal tests don't really work, what the hell are we doing using the data from them to try and evaluate a, a new method? And, and even, if a, even a good animal test, a very good animal test might give you um, a 70% reliability. That's just, and if you then, I think it was Leon who showed that if, if you then have an alternative test that gives you 
70% um, of the values you would, you would have got from the animal test, then you end up with more or less a 50-50 possibility. So why bother to, to do the test at all? Um, the other problem we have is, is levels of dosing. How could the rodent bioassay lifetime feeding at the maximum possible dose? How could that possibly tell you anything whatsoever about carcinogenicity in humans? And why the hell is it done? It's crazy. There are lots of crazy things around. We have to be polite, though, in trying to show you. Have, you have to be careful. <laughs> you, 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 you have to try to be understanding and polite. And by the way, no, I think there's a very important point here. We are working for the future. We are not trying to change things, things today. So if there are uh, procedures conducted, you know, um, if things are done today according to today's procedures, we have to accept that because the people involved, the regulators, have no alternative. But we ought to be working towards a different, better future, and I think that's what we can do. I uh, just want to finish up, because I'm going to run out of time. I think um, we should move on from the three R's, because the question of humanity, in particular in things like drug development, is really about human welfare as well. There is no need for us to be accused of being in favor of animal welfare at the expense of human welfare, because the kinds of things we want to do are good for everybody, and by the way, good for the industry. If the industry could stop wasting billions of dollars on drugs that don't work, then maybe um, they would appreciate the benefit of that as well. Um, okay, so the, other, the final point I will just make before I close is that we also ought to think deeply about the concept of replacement. We are not trying to replace animal tests. We should be trying to develop new tests which are relevant and reliable in terms of the human beings we're trying to, that we're trying to protect. So when we use um, human tissues and, and human volunteer studies, in an ethical and safe way. We should not be looking back at the animal data and saying, you know, have we, have we done as well as they did? We should be thinking in a completely different way about the questions we're trying to answer and have um, um, a huge choice of methods from which to select particular groups to answer particular problems. They should be used intelligently, strategically, in, in stepwise schemes, with decision trees, so that you work from, from, from unmanageable um, um, complexity and you, you find your way carefully through to high quality information that will help you make the kind of decisions that you need to make. So I, I think we should all go back and look at Russell and Birch's book. We should be prepared to um, find a way through it to find the key things he's saying and I think there are great messages there which would help us to think more effectively in the future and to have um, alternative methods given the recognition, the value, and the use they really deserve. Thank you. <laughs>